And uh, good afternoon. We are back again, and this time we have a very special guest, Mr. Kevin Briggs, and he is a mental health expert. And we'll bring Kevin in to allow him to say more about himself and what we're going to talk about today. Hello, Kevin. How are you, sir? Hi, Stanley. I'm doing great. Thank you very much for having me on the show. So tell us about yourself a little bit. Yeah. So um, really, I was with the California Highway Patrol for 23 years and did many, many years patrolling the Golden Gate Bridge, where I had encounters with folks contemplating suicide. Many of those folks would be over the pedestrian rail, standing on what we call the cord, C-H-O-R-D, contemplating jumping off that bridge and going the 220 feet down into the water. So I developed techniques on how to talk to folks. And, you know, most of the time they worked out well. I did lose some, some people on there, but I learned a lot about human nature and human dynamics. And I studied a lot and, and was able to talk to a lot of doctors and, and folks who had been working on the bridge prior to me. But uh, I did a TED talk, have a book out now, and I travel uh, quite a few times during the year and do presentations on how can we talk to folks at ground level right here, right now, so they don't get on top of that building or onto that bridge or have this gun pointed to their head. What can we do to be better listeners? So let's talk about how you became uh, the person to talk to people and talk them off of a bridge, literally and keep them from jumping. I mean, that's, that's a lot. I mean, it seems like that that's got to weigh heavy on you when you, 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 you talk to someone and then it, it, it does work. And sometimes it may not work. Right. I mean, that's gotta be pretty rough. Tell me about it. Well, I'm like the first call hit me like a ton of bricks here. I am in, we have Marin connects to San Francisco via that golden gate bridge. And I'm out of the Marin area of the highway patrol and I'm working down on the bridge as part of my beat. And I get this call of an individual over the rail and and then it really hits me whoa what do I, I have no clue i wasn't trained for this i had no training what do i say what do i do if that individual jumps am i in trouble am i responsible it was horrible and i think but what i did have was empathy you know of so, course i didn't want to see that person go so of course so you developed that you've been nicknamed the guardian of the golden gate Yes, sir. That is a that's an interesting title because it, it makes you wonder. I mean, what do you think when that happened? When someone said to you, "Hey, you are the guardian of the Golden Gate." I'm honored, but there's other uh, there's other people there that do the same job as I do, that do a wonderful job. There's other people all around the world that, when I say guardian of whatever that may be, maybe it's your house. You know, I, I take this. It's, it's an honor. It really is. But there's so many guardians out there. They're doing this same type of work, whether that's a parent talking to their kid, whatever that may be, you're that guardian. So I'll take it if it helps promote what we're trying to get across of listening to understand. So let's talk about mental health, because the segment is reasons why aliens would ever invade Earth. And my argument is that lack of mental health and mental um, training um, and, and, and counseling is the reason why aliens will never invade Earth. And I know we, it seems like a funny title, but when you think about it, we're missing this across the board when it comes to people getting mental health and mental health counseling. So tell me more about what what you've noticed in your, in your observations. And let's just start with active listening skills. When I go to do my presentations, I've been the way to the outback of Australia, I've uh, been to Mexico with 1,400 people standing in front of me. I ask folks, how many of you have had an actual active listening skills class? And I'm going to say less than 1% of everybody I've ever talked to in the past, since 2013, when I started doing this. Very few people get a class, an actual active listening skills. If we had that, we would listen better. We would reply better if we practice these also. So this is the class that I went to when I went through the FBI crisis negotiator school. Okay. This, this is what we practice and this is what we do. And this is our cornerstone, but I've seen it with mental health professionals personally. I've seen it with my boy to where that wasn't used to validate and to normalize what's going on with someone. And I've seen it with crisis counselors. Um, I don't know if you knew this, but I also work 
at the local schools here in my area two days a week. And I go to all the elementary schools, kind of a mentor and check it in and do home visits. So I see okay. a lot of that. And I see when a crisis counselor comes out, um, I've seen some good ones and I've seen some that, that really shouldn't be doing this type of work. So I think we need something nationally, even for the world of how to approach someone, whether that's a juvenile, whether that's an adult, how do we start this conversation and talk to someone to make them feel at ease? But it is, it starts with the training. Well, I'm going to go backwards for a minute, if I may, mm -hmm. and you trick me if I'm wrong. But in my opinion, and this is what I remember from, you know, growing up, uh, back in, I think it was the 80s when Ronald Reagan became president, one of the first things he did was get rid of mental health places, places that help with mental health. And then we noticed that there was an uptick of people wandering the streets, and it got more and more progressive. And if you go to San Francisco, it's, it's rampant, where there's so many people suffering from mental health issues, and there's no place for them to go. And even... If we fast forward to now and let's say we have a job and our job offers counseling, I've noticed that if you even want to book counseling, it could be three, four months down the line because they're either booked or there's no one available. You're absolutely correct. I've seen that myself. Um, if you didn't know, I, I have depression. I have PTSD, not from the job, from, but from when I was a little kid with some abuse. I've been through different therapies, different programs, and on the medications. So I, I have a working knowledge of this. Um, okay. Also, I've had my time where, where I wanted to see someone, and it's been a couple of months. Well, a couple, that doesn't work. That does not work. We, we need to a do a lot better than that. Well, it's, it seems to be, and someone just wrote, it seems to be a huge taboo now when you mention mental health. And people were like, oh, I don't want to get around. I, you know, I don't want to touch it. You know, and then and then I noticed that if you even say to someone, well, I think I have PDST, the first thing they'll say to you is, well, have you been diagnosed with PDST? Or PTSD, sorry, I always say it wrong. Or have you been diagnosed with it? And 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 if you say no, I haven't, then they assume that okay, then you can't be, you know. I mean, it affects people different ways. It really does. And I wouldn't go with that. It if you have something that's bugging you, that's really bugging you, and it's been traumatic and it affected you, whether that's a story, a, a life event, or you actually went through that, you're hurting. And you need to seek some help for that. If that's affecting your quality of life, then I would tell you to get some help. And I can tell you about me if you'd like and what happened and why I didn't seek help. And this is why many men don't, because we think we're this macho deal going on. I was with the California Highway Patrol. I rode a motorcycle, as you know. Yes. I went up in the rank to sergeant. You know, I worked on the Golden Gate Bridge um, and, and all these different things. I jumped out of the planes in the Army, and then I worked at San Quentin for a while. All these macho wow. jobs where I didn't want, want to show a weakness. You don't show a weakness. But that now, was so, back, back in the old days. So now, so people can get, and I think I froze up for a minute, but you, you stay there, and I'm going to keep asking you this question. So there was a time when people, I mean, you and I, we worked together uh, and people don't realize that we've actually connected each other when you were doing motorcycle and I was operating um, as a reporter for a station out there trying to get people to understand that they just slow down on the bridge. Uh, it's, it's, I've seen some of the things and I've actually been in a case where I was on a ride along and they had to rescue someone from the bridge. And it's a real interesting thing because the person is there to jump. You're called to save that person from jumping and taking their own life. And then basically when they, when, it, when you take them off, they're, they're handcuffed and people are like, well, why are you handcuffing this person? They just tried to kill themselves. But that's, it's more to the story than just, I mean, just because someone's put in handcuffs doesn't mean that they're under arrest if they're going to commit, if they're there to commit a suicide. There's a there's a there's a reason why that's done. Can you explain that to me? Absolutely. And you know what? I got a call a few years ago from a very large news agency to ask me that one question. I said, <laughs> well, here I could just tell you my opinion, and of course it was our policy. But here's how I do it, and this is what I do when I'm talking to someone over the rail. When they allow me to come up and speak with them, one of the first things I tell them is, "You are not in trouble." Most of the time. The vast majority of the time, these people have done nothing wrong. They're hurting and they want that pain to end. So I will tell them, as far as I know, you haven't done anything wrong. When, and I tell them when you come back over, 
I have to put you in handcuffs. That's only because it's our policy. You're not going to get a ticket. You're not going to get something down the line later on. I'm not taking you to jail. I have to take you to a hospital for a mental health evaluation and you'll never see me again. So by doing this, it really sets their mind at ease. Okay. I've never in doing that. I've never had an issue with someone. I've had an issue with family members that come along later on or write a letter to me or call my office and say, why were they in handcuffs? It wasn't explained to them, but by me explained to them. And when I teach officers at negotiator conferences, this is what I tell them. And this is why you should do this. Don't think we're all Billy badass and all that. It's about them. This is not the Kevin Briggs show. It never was and never will be. It is about that individual that you're speaking with. So by telling them that upfront about the handcuffs, now if they have a warrant or something else, it's a little different. But we'll talk about that. But we want them safe. And as far as I know, with the folks that I've been dealing with, you haven't done anything wrong, but I have to put you in handcuffs. And I'll tell you, I never had an issue. But And it also sets their mind at ease. Because okay. they think not only are things going bad and I'm over this rail and I'm contemplating losing my life today. But now if I come back, now I'm going to jail. Simply not so. That is, when you think about it, I mean, it's, it's, I mean, I watched it and I watched it as another officer, wasn't you, but another officer had to talk a guy down. And um, I was there shooting a behaving badly segment. When I went back to the office, so it clearly couldn't make it behaving badly because I don't believe in that as being an issue of someone misbehaving. It's, it's a lot to do with mental mental health, something that we're lacking nowadays. Um, people reach out for help all the time, but we overlook it. And just like you were going to um, tell me a story about how what happened to you when you were growing up and what caused you to have the, the problem that you had, you know, you, you wonder how many people are experiencing this. And now with the with the uh, with the pandemic, it's just made. It's just made things crazy. And I don't mean to use that in a in a in a in a in a, in a bad connotation, but it's just made things it's just it's made things crazy. And here's a strange one for you. I, I just received some numbers um, from I believe, this came from the CDC that in 2019, the numbers actually, if I'm getting this right, I got to look away from this camera for a second. That's the okay. Numbers actually went down for the first time in 2019. From 2018, the number of people who lost their life to suicide actually went down 2.1%. That's the first time in two decades. Wow. So what do you what do you think is the cause of that? So that was a that was a, a couple of years ago, but you know that's what I'm looking at here is, um, yeah, from that. So many factors, you know, better health care, but I think people there's so much on the computer now that we can do and the, I'll probably say this wrong, the tele, teletherapy okay. is starting to catch on. And I think that's really cool. So I could sit here with my doctor, which I've done my regular doctor, physician. I've had, you know, since we're not supposed to be going into the office right now, I've had my chats with him. But to do teletherapy with someone right here would be cool too. If you can't get to them for whatever reason, at least we can do this. And that saves a lot of time. It's not as in person but it's better than nothing. So I think that's catching on more and more. And there's also now um, paid services that will charge you $85 a month and you get so many services that you can go online and talk to someone. So that's helping. Okay, so we're gonna take a break for a minute. When we come back, we're gonna talk more about your experience growing up because I do wanna hear your experience and I'll let you talk about it uh, as long as you want to. And then I won't even jump in it and say what's going on. I want to hear the whole thing because I don't want to. I'll, I'll have a million questions in my head, but I'd rather hear your story because I want to see how it relates to some things I experienced growing up. And then we can, you know, exchange war stories, so to speak. So we're gonna take a little break. We'll be back in a moment. <sighs> we watch TV for. Wow. Could you get me some water, please? Sure. Do you want water in a nondescript bottle? Or would you like it in your caught misbehaving mug? Why are you saying nondescript bottle? I'm confused. Because we don't have a sponsor. Oh, that's right. We have a sponsor. Uh, so I guess you can't eat none of your nondescript ice cream. 
Nope, because I really want some ice cream, but I got to get it from a nondescript container. Wow, I mean, it seems kind of strange that we're saying nondescript. What do we have to do to change that? Get a sponsor. A what? A sponsor! Oh, and that's why we have this little gap in between so that a... Sponsor! ...can fill in the blanks. And we don't have to say nondescript anymore. We could say... Sponsor! Instead of... Nondescript. But instead we keep saying... Nondescript. nondescript. <laughs> Thank you for uh, tuning in with us and... Uh, we hope to find a sponsor really soon. soon. And we're back to our program. All right, so we're back with Kevin Briggs, mental health expert. Uh, Kevin, while we were uh, one, Diane made it clear to me that there have been some questions about uh, uh, some issues some people brought up, and we will go through that in a minute. But what I said before we left was I wanted to hear about your experience growing up and what caused you to have the issues that you have and what led you to where you are now. So I'll make this quick, but there's a whole gamut of things. When I was very, very young, there was some abuse by a non-family member over a period of time. And, and as I got older, I would see a, a man's face right here when I would try to sleep. And it haunted me every single night when I would try to sleep. Um, I eventually was able to get some, some therapy for that. But I didn't want the therapy. I didn't think there was anything wrong. But I will tell you just to back step a minute, a couple other things. I had testicular cancer when I was just 20 years old well, in the here. army. In the army. And then my mother died when she was 49 years old at home. Um, I closed her eyes. She died because of cancer. I've had some head injuries on the motorcycle, some concussions that do take a large effect on, on your cognitive abilities. So I have a son who was suicidal and still suffers. Uh, a lot of different things that happens in people's lives. And I've had a lot of stuff going on. But with this one particular face that would haunt me, when I would try to sleep. I just couldn't get past this. So I wanted to see a psychiatrist. And here's what's happened. And here is what I tell folks. I went to my regular doctor. Actually, I emailed him and said, Doc, I told him I am not suicidal, but I have some things going on and I cannot sleep at night very well. I'd like to see a psychiatrist. He wrote me back and said, Kevin, he goes, since you're not actively suicidal, I don't recommend that you see a psychiatrist. But if you do, here's the number and best wishes to you. That was really crappy. And I tell everybody, don't go off of that. You go by how you're feeling. And don't. I don't care how many years of college or training what you have. If it's not right, it's not right. So I did wow. go and see a, a psychiatrist. And she was wonderful. She sat there. I'm not a big fan of barriers. You probably know this by now. She yes. has her desk. And she's sitting behind this. And I'm on the other side. Not right behind the desk. I'm on the side of it. So she just turns and faces me. And we had a wonderful chat. And she listened. And this was the first time I ever spoke about this. And I don't go into detail about it. I still can't. It's just, and I'm 58 years old, and I still can't talk about it that much. But I did with her. I went and I had eye movement desensitization and reprocessing, EMDR therapy. She recommended that to me. And I okay. had to take this type A conservative guy and kind of let that go. Open my mind. I got, I had uh, three stents in my heart, also heart surgeries, high cholesterol, high blood pressure, all this stuff that a donut eating cop is going to get, right? So I go and I, I do the therapy and I say, you know what? I'm going to open my mind because I didn't really didn't believe in all of this stuff. And I've been on a couple of meds for depression. Okay. I had to let it all go and say, you know what? I got to start thinking about me. So I went through this therapy and this lady told me, the therapist, she goes, Kevin, I cannot take that trauma away. But what we can work on is instead of that face being right here in your face at night, we're going to get it so it's way the hell out there. And I said, I'm just going to do whatever you tell me and try to take this with an open mind. And that's what I did. And I went through it and that's what happened. And it worked. And I was able to sleep better because of this. Wow. Years ago, I wouldn't have went to any kind of therapy. I, I'm you man up, you suck it up, and you handle it. But I can yeah. tell you, it just gets too much. Well, people people will quickly tell you to man up all the time for certain things. They'll be like, man up. You can, you can handle it. Just just do what you need to do. And, you know, and you're like, you want to be a man and say, I'll do it. I'll do it. I'm a man up. But then basically, though, you end up not getting the help you need because you're, you know, because of what's going on. You're just You're just not getting it. And people go without getting it. And a lot of times they want to give you a lot of medication. Right. 
um, and they want to medicate you. And so someone asked the question, um, how many of the folks um, that have mental health issues uh, that are more aggressive maybe lack medicine or, 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 or could be due to drugs that they're taking? And what's the best way for folks to deal with that? And that's a big one. If you're if you're taking recreational drugs, if that's what they're referring to, you know, that can have a lot of effects on its own with you financially and, and mood swings and everything else. You know, we I mean, I'm saying as a cop here, but also as a father and and as a friend to every person out there, I'm telling you, we got to get off of that stuff and get onto something more holistic or what can we do that's best for you and even the drugs. I'm, I do a lot of research and there's people saying that sometimes those don't even work, but I'm telling you, go with what the professionals say, try it, see how it goes for you. There's a lot of different things out there. You have to find the right combination, but it's not just that it's, it's how we live and how we act. Sometimes I still battle and, and have her have this uh, depression that I don't want to go outside. I could spend three days in this house and not go out. I just, it's anxiety and everything else. But sometimes I will force myself to go out and then things start to look up and get a little better. This is nothing I wanted. It sucks being inside. I like going out. But if if that's how you're feeling and that's what's going on, it's okay for a while. But if you So, so that, that, that makes me think about something because we talked about this when we were talking the other day is that social media has made us to the point where we didn't want to be out in public. We would text people. We would... Uh, DM people and you try to reach out and go, I don't do it public. I don't do it in real life. I'd rather just deal with social media. Then the, pan the pandemic hit and the government said, stay indoors. So we were already trained through social media, but now everybody's like, no, I'm going to be out. So why is it that when we're, when we're, when we're, when we're told to stay in, we want to be out. I think that's it. Cause you were told to stay in. Well, you're not going to tell me what to do. Big government is going to run my life. But I will tell you, if you can find some folks that you get along with most of the time and you can go out for coffee, tea, whatever you're doing, do that. I know folks now, because many of us, um, especially here in California, are still on lockdown and things. I have some friends that will do like a Zoom every Friday night at, at 7 p.m. and they're doing their wine drinking as they're sitting at home, having, having a Zoom meeting, something like that, some kind of meeting or on this platform here. So there's that, but we need this connection. And I will tell you, please try and put that phone down and look someone in the eye and have that conversation. It's a lot harder. It is. But we see, especially kids, kids text all day long. That's so, why right. Well, we have this, we have the 1-800-273-TALK line, National Suicide Prevention Lifeline, but there's also the crisis text line. And I will tell you, that's big with the kids, the 741-741 crisis text line, because they don't necessarily want to chat, but they will, they'll be on that thing. Boy, I, I'm yes. amazed at how fast they can work that. You know, it's funny. Playing, yeah. You're amazing. Games and stuff. Yeah. That they will type a whole, you know, the, you know, this as a sergeant that you guys have a hard time recruiting um, officers that are younger because they're so used to, to texting. They can text a message in a heartbeat, but when you ask them to write a, a police report, they're lost that and face someone face to face. Yes. Not everybody's happy with us out there. I like what face to face. Do? So it's important. So when we say man up, does gender uh, play a role in mental health and mental health management? We say man up, but it's really anybody, but it typically men try to be more, more macho. It's why I suffered for a very, very long time because I had these macho jobs, so to speak, where I, in my mind was not allowed to show a weakness. And I thought if I do, it's not a weakness, it's your life. It's the way things are going. If I do come out and talk about this, am I going to lose my job? Am I going to lose friends? What's going to happen? When I finally came out and started talking about all this, look where I'm at. I'm on your show. This would have never happened. You know, I, I get to travel the world. I've been to places like Borneo. I've been to Germany, Mexico a number of times, Canada, I've been all, Australia, New Zealand, been all over talking about this because I came out and talked about it. And I tell the truth and this is how it is. And this is what happened in my life. And this is what's happening to other folks. How can we make it better? So how do we make it better? We start with these. What we are doing right now is fantastic. We're talking about it and we're telling folks it's okay to go and seek help. Do what's best 
for you. If you're not feeling right, and that goes for a couple of weeks, try to get some help. I know it's tough out there. I know financially it's tough. I know it's, it can be hard to get an appointment in there, but work on it. See what's out there. Research some things on the computer. Have some conversations with some friends, but some close friends and some good friends. And if you're the one that is receiving that communication from someone, make the time to chat with them. Let them know that you're there for them 24 hours a day. If you can't pick up the phone right then, you'll get to it as soon as you can. People need to know that you're in their corner. That is so huge. So there was another uh, question that popped up, and I think I scrolled past it, and it was from Rosalinda Randall. She is one of my guests before who's always logging in and making sure that she listens in, and she's a civility expert. Uh, and, you know, one of her books that she put out was about, you know, being civil and, 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 and civil has a lot to do with mental health as well. But she wanted to know if, if um, that she, she said she imagines there's a cultural constraint that discourages people from asking for help. And I, I know for a fact that there in, in the black community, if you go and ask for help, you are you're ostracized by some people saying, well, you know, what are you doing? Why are you doing this? Why are you putting our family business in the street? What do you think about that? You're absolutely right. Absolutely right. I dealt with a man named Kevin Berthia, and there's a photograph out there that, that many people have seen of him over the rail. And he is the only guy that I've dealt with that I actually kept in contact with. And it was years later. And we do keep in contact and we get to go on stage and tell our story about what happened that day. But he comes flat out and says it that because that picture was posted in all the newspapers here in the Bay Area. He hated that picture because it shows a black man in a very weak point in his life. Right. But he has come full way around that and found out that he can use that to help others. So you are absolutely right. Wow. So, you know, the first time I ever cried, I think publicly, and I don't think it was like on social media, but I actually physically cried once. And and my producer, Diane, says she's never seen me cry. But the one time I did cry and I literally boohooed was when I was laying on a gurney in the hospital in San Mateo County, just having a stroke. And then you realize that everything in your life that you've tried to achieve is right now can go away in a few seconds. And, you know, I'm on the phone and people didn't believe me. They're like, you know, you're kidding me. My own daughter was like, she says, are you okay? And I, go, I had a stroke, but you couldn't understand me. And she's like, no, you're joking. And so it, it became a point where you, you become emotional and, and people don't want to believe that men can cry. They want to believe that men, you know, that, you know, there's things that they don't believe. I mean, they don't believe making a breast cancer. They don't believe men can cry. You know, I'm real man, never cry. But that was my very first time. And it, it made me come to life and realize that there's a lot going on than just what I'm doing. Right. And how it is said to you when I was diagnosed with testicular cancer, that's a, that's a big blow to a guy. And I was yes. only 20 years old. I turned 21 in the hospital. In Letterman Army Medical Center, I, I was diagnosed in Germany in the Army. They flew me back here to the States. At 21, I landed here, age 21, when everybody on the West Coast was supposed to go to Vegas partying. I'm at Letterman Army Medical Center. It, it sucked. It was horrible. I had chemotherapy and, and everything else. But that is a big hit. you know. And, and as we progress in life, things happen. Um, they say many, many times when you go through trauma, sometimes it's just not the trauma that happened to you or the pain that you were in. But it's what is said to you. And this is true when I was diagnosed, when I had my heart issue. It took me three days to go to a hospital because I was stubborn. I had some symptoms. And when I went, the doctor comes in the room and they did a blood test. Uh, EKG was fine, by the way. But they did a blood test. And the blood test came back poorly. Your heart puts out an enzyme when it's not operating at full right. function. So the doctor comes in and he goes, he says it like this. And this is what I remember out of the whole trauma. He goes, Kevin... There's an issue with your heart, and we're going to need to try and figure out what it is. That's what I remember. You know, that's horrible. If that, when you have a doctor come in and tell you this in the emergency yeah. room, you know, there's no games. You're like, am I ever going to see my boys again? I remember tearing up. I go, oh, my God, I could, I could tear up right now. I you may not walk out of there. Yeah, I remember my doctor came to me and said, oh, we think there's something wrong with your heart, too. So we're going to have to probably do open heart surgery. And I'm like, what? <laughs> and so There's I'm like, gotta what? be a better way of telling you these things. Yeah, it, it turned out not to be anything to do with my heart whatsoever. It was stress. But we're gonna take another break for one more minute, and we'll be right back, and then we'll talk some more about a couple more issues, and uh, and we'll talk about. And if you're just joining us, 
I'm with Kevin Briggs, uh, pivotalpoints.com. Yes, sir. Pivotal-points.com. Hyphen points. Pivotal-points.com. And we're talking about mental health and uh, an issue that is prominent in American society and, and, and worldwide. So we're going to discuss more about it in about a minute. So stick around. Uh, Got to find another commercial to do. Yeah, I was just thinking about that. Wait, where'd you come from? I was listening to your thoughts. Oh, uh, get out of my head. Uh, so what do we do so we don't have to use the word nondescript again? Well, we could say we're lacking a character. Like we're characterless. You saying we have no character? I'm saying we need a sponsor. Oh, but we can't. But characterless sounds like, like a cartoon with no mouse. Don't say that mouse's name. I... It's, it's not sponsored. I was just saying a mouse. It could be any mouse. What are we going to do? Oh. We need a sponsor. All right. If you can hear our voices, we need a sponsor for our podcast. Is that better? That's better. All right. Thank you. Bye. And we're back, Kevin. My goodness, I'm reading the, some of the chats where we're on, and it's like it's this is something people say that we need a lot of, and we don't have enough of is mental health. And and the issue that I wanted to bring up right now, which we discussed before, but I think it's very it bugs me a lot. And you know, you explain it to me, and you maybe understand it more than I did before. But whenever we see someone acting out on social media, and we know we we I call it bad behavior. Some people call it other things. The first go-to for everybody is, oh, they have mental health issues. Is everybody acting out on social media having mental health issues, or is there just just plain bad behavior? I think there's there's both. There's mental health issues, and then there's bad behavior. I I totally agree on that. And I think you know when when folks do things, a lot of them are just looking for the reactions. What can I get? Or maybe they want followers or whatever else, but there, you know, we see it and we hear about it. And there's a lot of bad stuff going on out there that folks do this to get more popular. Hell, be honest with you that I don't, I'm debating whether I should say this or not, but several years ago, there was a kid on a, from a school walking across the bridge with his school. And maybe you remember this one young adolescent. He jumped off the bridge as a joke. Oh, I he remember lived. that. Yes. He lived. He got a little messed up. I think he was 14 at the time. But come on. I mean, very few people survive that. You are very, very lucky to live. We got to draw a line somewhere. So you're right. We've gotten to the point now where it's not even, I mean, we, we dismiss it as mental illness. But when you have people doing stuff just for attention, just for likes, just for, and, and, and the way things work now is the more crazy you do something, the more people will follow you. And you're like, well, if they if it works for that, then it'll work for this. And then you hear about it and you say, well, this person was was uh, was seriously injured by one of the stunts they pulled. Remember the guy that I posted, he taped himself to a car and they were doing they were driving down the 880 freeway in Oakland. He duct taped himself to the car so he can get ready for this. He wanted to get sponsored by Gorilla Tape. <laughs> <laughs> See, <laughs> you think you do you think that corporation Gorilla Tape, which is a huge organization, huge corporation, is going to want that? They don't want that on them. They want but nothing to do with that. You may say that, but some cases they do. And Gorilla Gorilla Tape may not have, but in some cases, some people have done something super, super crazy and dangerous, and then five days later, they're being sponsored by right, you know, SuperDangerous.com. I look at always looking at liability and, and you, you may think it's funny and whatnot, but I think folks, if you live through this, wait till you're 50 or 60, you're going to be hurting. You are going to be hurting, boy. We just starts to go down, you know, knees, hips, joints, but yes, where is I your mean, mind at? Are, do you really need that much from people saying, Oh, you're the best. Thank you so much. I love you. Do it for yourself. Do what, what you think is right. And really what is right to make your life better and those around you better so how do we ignore the stupidity of people doing stuff and then but not ignore someone who clearly has mental issues because we can't seem to figure out which is which anymore they're in a big pot together we we, right. we label everything as the same 
many, many times those who are suffering aren't going to post it. They don't want stuff to know. They'll look stuff up. They'll see it on there. But it's what we see. Maybe they would be out a lot. You'd go to coffee with them three, four times a week. And they were always laughing. And you guys would have a good time. You'd talk on the phone a couple times a day or a week. And now they don't want to. They don't want to come out of the house. They're self-isolating. They used to dress very nice. And now they're not. And they let themselves go quite a bit. Um, maybe they're giving away their belongings. Maybe they're talking about not. You don't have to worry about me in two weeks. Everything's going to be great. Well, we're thinking they're going on vacation and they're going to have a good time. But what is really going on? Really? What, what's happening? So these little things to check in, to take these clues and ask them about it. Of course, not everybody is suicidal or going that direction. But let's find out, you know. So does everyone have at some point in life maybe have suicidal thoughts, which isn't the same as having suicidal thoughts, which I know it sounds like the same word. When you think about it, it's like somebody goes, hey, you know what, if, if I was dead tomorrow, nobody would care. Or if you're sitting there holding a gun in your hand going, if I pull this trigger, then, you know, it's over it. Right. You know, and I think I can't speak for everybody, but I think many of us, well, what would happen if I just wasn't here anymore? Yeah. You know, I mean, me, I'm who's, who's taking care of everything. But if I'm really thinking, you know what, and I start planning it and I'm really thinking about it and looking it up on the computer, how do people do this? That's a whole different story. Boy, you need some help. You need some help. You're probably going through a very tough time. And and many times we're talking about people that are homeless sometimes, or they've they've battled depression, bipolar, they can't see a way out. They think they've tried every medication if they've been diagnosed and given a medication. You know, there's so many things to where they're going down. Maybe they've stayed with their aunts or uncles, brothers, sisters, and now they feel like they're a burden to their families. That's a big one. So what can they do? And that is that is so hard. You know, how can you help? We see it a lot with our homeless folks. So what I've learned though, and this is just from experience, is that sometimes if you just listen to someone, you know, you don't have to give an opinion. You could just listen. Listening to some person's issues can go a long way than ignoring them completely. And we watch people and push them to the side and think, you know what, I got bigger problems. But then you don't think that maybe if you just stopped and listened for five minutes, you know, that could make a big difference in someone's personal or, or, or psychological well-being. And my mantra is listen to understand. Not that we can fix things, but we can certainly try and understand what that individual is going through. And like you just said, a five minutes of your time, so what? You may have changed somebody's course of life, or at least for that day even. So it, it doesn't take a whole lot to listen to someone, to really be there and take some time to do that. But it is an acquired skill. We speak a, a lot faster than we can hear the words. We we can we, actually we can hear a lot more than what we're speaking and we're contemplating things. So as you're talking to me, I'm thinking, mine, how can I reply? Well, that's kind of wrong, I'm going to say. I should be taking in everything that you're telling me and listening to that and then come up with a response if a response is even needed. That's interesting. I mean, cuz you you want to respond you kind of mm -hmm. want to say something and it may not be the right answer at the time. And then some people tend to go, well, you know what, dude, I got more problems than you got. I'm not going to hear it right now. And that's exact. I was one of those guys for a long time. I'm still working on that. But where we say where we're competitive, we say, what kind of listener are you? Are you a competitive one that you're listening to somebody? And then let me tell you my fish story because yeah, your fish was this big, but mine was this big. My fish was bigger. Yes. <laughs> Let me tell you about this one. And and I and and I use the excuse because I'll forget it within two minutes. So I gotta tell you now. Let me let me interrupt you. And it doesn't work. Come on. You'll see people get get very angry. And I caught myself doing that a lot. I say, you know what? Shut up. Just shut up. And let people tell you their story. Because when I'm telling a story, I want people to listen and pay attention. And hopefully it it is a good story and people can take something out of it, whether that's humorous or not. But really sit down and listen. Don't compare yourself. I told you some of the things I've been involved in. Yes. I do not talk about that when I'm talking with someone over that rail contemplating suicide. Because like I said, it's not the Kevin Briggs show. It is about that individual. Like Kevin Berthea over the rail, the black man. We, sp we spoke for an hour and a half. But I spoke for maybe five, six minutes out of that whole time. Right. And he, when he came over, he was not going to come back over. He had no intention of living that day. This was a, a really iffy one. 
But when he came back over, I asked him, and I did every single person because I want to learn, what did I do that helped the situation? And what did I do that wasn't so good that hurt this situation? And he thought about it for a second. And he said, you listened. You let me speak and you listen. Yes, so that's what I tell exactly. folks. Why did it take this man to drive from Oakland all the way over to the Golden Gate Bridge where he's never been before that's a long for way. somebody to listen? Yes. Why can't we do that right now? So um, what I've learned is that in during, even when I worked on my segments is that I come across a lot of people. And everybody I come across doesn't actually end up on television. Sometimes I'll listen to their, their story. They'll tell me, and I'll put the camera down. And I'll listen to them and I'll, I'll, I'll swing it over my shoulder and I'll just listen to them. And, and then when I get done, says, and I'll say, you know, sounds, sounds fair to me because you realize that even though I caught them doing something that probably would make great TV, I realize that there's more going on than just that one person and what, you know, me putting something out there, there there's more to it. Yeah. And I've had people that roll, roll along with me like interns and goes, wow. You know, I didn't realize that you're you're actually a psychologist when you're out there doing your segments. And I'm like, you'd be surprised how many people you have a moment. And I've become a great speaker based on the fact that I can and a great listener just by listening to other people and tell me what's going on with them. And 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 just like with you, with the higher patrol and your retired sergeant, and you how many years were you with the higher patrol? Twenty-three. Twenty-three years. And your job is to be a good listener, but also sort out fact from fiction all within a few seconds. Right. Right. And that's especially true, you know, listening up on that bridge with folks because the majority of the time they have not been listened to. And I tell everyone because they think to be able to have this courageous conversation with someone who may be suicidal that I have no training. I can't do this. I'm going to tell you, you could probably do many, many times a better job than somebody that's been trained to do it. If you have empathy and you care. Because I've seen folks who are highly trained, but they, they're they burned out. They simply just, well, here's what we're going to do. And their arms are folded like yes. this. And they're standing up when the, when the individual is sitting down. I always try to be at eye level with people. You know, there's a lot of little things that we do. Um, but that's what this is about, making that human connection. And, if, and I, I'll share something with you. Just okay. like giving a ticket with the Highway Patrol for folks. If we can get that individual who I'm giving that ticket to, to say, thank you. Boom. I sold the ticket and my job. So they understand what they did. They got a ticket, but they still said, thank you. Yes. Boom. I did a good job. I hey, I said ticket. thank you twice in my life to the, to the higher patrol in Mendocino County. And well, the other one, I didn't say thank you to, I guess, I guess I did say thank you. And that was on the 80 freeway. This was, you know, many, 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 many years ago before I even started doing uh, uh, behavioral story, stories. But yeah, yeah so, you know, it's educating i mean sometimes you know our job especially on the motor we, we gave a lot of tickets welcome to the world this is reality what we do but when you're walking up to that car that's you know i mean imagine me standing there i mean it's not standing sitting in my car and i'm getting i just got pulled over and there's blue and red lights behind me and it's just long slow motion walk uh, as a matter of fact i'll explain to you more like this so my ticket i got on the 80 freeway the 885 i just had knee surgery so i hadn't driven in like six months Finally driving, I'm, I, some guy wanted to race me. I don't know why I was young, dumb, you know. I accelerated. And as I accelerate, there's a motor on the 85 freeway with his LIDAR gun pointed right at me. And I see him. And at that point, everything in my life becomes slow motion. <laughs> so it's like I go by him. He's taking the, the, the radar gun, putting it back into the his little pouch in the back. I see him lift the bike up, get on it, drive away, come up behind me. And I self-surrender because I already knew that he was coming after me. I already knew that, but it was like a slow motion and a mental thing. It's like, how do I, how do I avoid getting a ticket from this guy? So I got like, and he's walking up. My mind is going a mile a second going, oh my God, I'm about, you know, what's going to happen? I mean, put me in your shoes. You're pulling up behind me yeah. and I'm walking and you're walking up to the car. Mentally, what's going through your mind? Mentally, first thing is always officer safety. I want to see your hands. I'm not yelling. I'm not screaming. I'm not doing I'm just walking up and I want to see your hands because it's about me going home too. number one. And right. I want you to be safe. I don't want you to stop in a bad area. You know, we are. It's it's safety for everybody involved. 
And I'm going to tell you why I stopped you. I'm, I'm not a big believer in these folks. I think we got off base here, but I'm not. I'm no, not no, a no. Big believer I, 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 there's in, a point where I'm going here. I'm going here because mentally, there's two different mental mentalities right there now. There is. It's but me I'm and tell you. you why I stopped you. First thing. Hi, sir. I stopped you because I'm, I don't believe in that. I need your driver's license, registration, and insurance. Tell somebody why they're stopped. Tell them why you're there. And that way they, they know what's going on. I stopped you because you were speeding. Here's what you were doing. And then get their info and say, okay, here's what's going to happen. So that mentally, you get, ticket, you get a ticket. So that mentally changes. I mean, so, you know, we're talking about mental health. And obviously, the whole trans, what happens between point A and point B can affect someone's mental health, even if it's on a small scale. Oh, it can. Absolutely. For that, nobody wants to get a ticket. It's It can be a, you know, there's a fine attached if you're found guilty. It could be right. a point on your record. But you see it out here you where you're at and I, and I see it every day you know I, I, be honest with you these people are nuts out here how many times have you ever hit the freeway you ever hit the freeway out here and not get cut off oh i, mean, I know hey go. you should come to arizona bro uh, <laughs> you think getting cut off okay get cut off times 10 out here because it's like this is like forget it see nobody has driver training out here bring your patience it's just <laughs> you know road brain. rage nah just just as I got, it took me so many, it took me decades to develop some patience. Just say, let it go. So, but this is all it does. What you're saying, it all evolves around mental health. All, what do you want to do with that act? You right. can be extremely mad at me for stopping you. You, we can do the black white thing. We can do all this stuff, which doesn't make it any better. So, going back to saying, for, you know, on point about mental health, you've actually done something. You've done a TED talk. Now, I'm, right. I haven't reached the level of TED talk. I mean, you went straight to TED talk. I'm still at Fred talk. You're at TED talk. <laughs> I did. I did a TED talk um, and and we discussed it a little bit. I'll be very honest with you. I did not really know what a TED talk was. I was embarrassed. So I called up a mentor of mine and he said, what the hell are you doing? You call him back right now. Called him back. They flew me up. Uh, it had changed because there's just, as far as I know, there's still just one TED talk per year. The others are TEDx's. They'll have in cities and things. But I was invited to do this TED talk along with with 50 people a year that get chosen to do this. So I went up to Vancouver and I'm preparing and I and I have this deal and they actually gave me a, another minute or a minute and a half or something, which I didn't I didn't know anything about this stuff. I didn't even know about talking. This is one of my first talks presentations. I didn't know what wow. I was doing. So I get up there and I'm talking to this one gentleman. Mine was on Friday in the morning. So I had the whole week to prepare still and, and watch other speakers. But I asked this one gentleman who was extremely wealthy from the oil business in Texas and he's retired. And this is where the human insight comes in. Uh, after watching these folks and seeing who's attending this, there's a lot of money there. There is. There's, oh, there's yeah. people with a lot of education and other people yes. a lot of money and and everything else. And I go, God, I just, I don't think I fit in with this. I'm having some breakfast with him. And he goes, Kevin, he goes, I want you to look around. Have you seen anybody else here, a talk or otherwise that have saved somebody? Exactly. He goes, you fit in here more than, than anybody else. So he, he really helped me and get my confidence to do this talk. And, and God bless me. Um, I was having some trouble memorizing some of the things that I wanted to say because I really worked on this. I wanted it to be right. I spent most of that week in my room practicing. But so when it came out and went on stage, it was the funniest thing. It's never happened before. And I've done a few hundred talks now. But I went on stage and they give you this, cer this certain area to walk around. Yeah, by the they use exit on the ground. Yes. So as I'm doing the talk, I'm trying to look at the audience here, look at the audience here, get everything out right. And... And as I'm doing this, the words are coming out right, and I'm saying everything right, and I'm thinking in my head, I'm doing a TED Talk. I'm doing a TED Talk as I'm <laughs> saying it and walking around. It was the weirdest thing. Oh, you know, it's I've done some speeches here and there. I mean, I've, okay, I was invited to a plumber's convention. <laughs> I have no <laughs> idea what bad behavior in plumber's <laughs> convention has to do with. the plumber's convention. So, yeah. And and I won. I, wait, wait. I won. I won a faucet. I'm like, okay. That's awesome. I, love <laughs> I don't it. even have an apartment, but I won a faucet. <laughs> um, I was invited to an engineers convention in Monterey. I spoke at a union convention, and you know, but I've never the level you reached, and it's because the truth be told, all jokes aside, you've saved over is it over or close to 200 lives just by the gift of gab and convincing them that there's other things in life than just committing suicide. 
um, I dealt with four to six, we say, cases a month for about 10 years. That's up to a lot of people. And I, and I hate, I don't, I'm not going to hate, I don't use the word saved. I try to stay away from that. Okay. Because I didn't rush into a burning building and grab them and pull them out. I think I was there for folks for a very dark day. As other yeah. folks do the same type of work that I do. We, we, we talked about this, you know, this guardian of the it, Golden Gate thing. There's many guardians of many Golden Gates all around the world, including a father talking to or, or a wife talking to their kids at home. You're that guardian. You do the same thing that I do. So let's do this together. How can we become better at this and help some people? Every day, someone is out there trying to talk someone literally off a ledge, whether it's the Golden Gate Bridge or the... Uh, Tycone Narrows Bridge or, t- or the right. bridge in you know, East Coast. Uh, there's always somebody there. And, and some people are better at it than other people. And their whole job is to come out there and try to convince you that this is not a good idea, that there is help. But some people ask for help their entire life, but don't get the help until they reach that, that level. And in some cases, the people who are tasked with helping people aren't getting the help they need. Right. It is a tough one. It's it's hard to navigate the system to know what's right. Um, you know, I've done it, but I've been on both sides of it. Luckily, I've been um, financially because I've been with the Highway Patrol, so they covered it. But if I didn't have a job that allowed me to get the mental health services or if I like with the heart issue and be covered, I don't know where to go. Is the community going to handle that? You know, with the Highway Patrol, we can see a professional through the employee assistance program seven times per fiscal year. That's fantastic. Many, many jobs allow that. But these are, and right now, these are really tough times. You know, we're seeing businesses close by the day, droves yes. of them. Yes. This is such a tough time right now. That's why I think you have friends, I have friends. We need to keep on top of those folks and they should be talking to us. How, we re- how are we really doing? So, should, really. so so we should tell people, if you're listening and you have someone that you haven't talked to in a while, pick up the phone and ask them, just ask them, how are they doing? And let them talk. Let them talk Absolutely. for a few minutes. Don't interrupt and say, well, let me tell you how I'm doing. Because you called, ask them how they're doing. Let them, you never know what you might hear. And don't make false, I always tell people, one of the things we have now is we like to make false, uh, like if someone someone passed away. They'll call you up and say, everything you need, I'm here to help. But then you never hear from them again. If you don't intend to help, then don't offer an olive branch that doesn't really mean anything. If you're going to help, then help. And if you know someone who needs help, they should reach out and help them, correct? And especially when it comes to grief. When we look at the grief cycle, denial, anger, bargaining, depression, and acceptance, and then even meaning, when we're looking at that, if you have someone like I, I have a very close mentor. Uh, he just lost his wife of three decades a few weeks wow. ago. So I'm calling him not to bug him, but say, hey, you know, just checking on you today. How, how you feeling? How you doing? And let him talk. Just let, and he likes to talk. So I know it's going to be a while on that phone, but that's OK, because he would be there for me and I would do it anyway. That's the thing. And and not to do it for a couple of weeks. Do you think they're better? They're not better. The average no. death takes a couple of years before we can start to move on a bit, not forget or forget the past or what happened, but to move on ourselves a bit. Can you imagine with a suicide, how long it would take? Now here's something that I want to bring in here because you know, you're law enforcement. I'm a journalist. 30 years I've been in TV one way or another, whether it's, you know, local news or TV shows. And, but local news and news in itself does not do stories about suicide. You know, they may mention a high profile murder suicide, but they rarely mention suicides. And the reason why is because this is their opinion that uh, if you report a suicide, then more people will commit suicide so they can be on the news. Right. What do you think about that? I think it's wrong in a lot of aspects. It's how you report it. Hey, this year, for instance, I'll just throw this out there. Let's just say, and this is not true, but for instance, hey, we had the 1,000th. 999th person jumped from the bridge today. Well, somebody's thinking who who isn't doing well that's been contemplating suicide. God, one more. They're the number 2,000. You know, that's something in the books to be number 2,000. When that movie, The Bridge, came out, 
Yeah, I was going to mention that one. <clears throat> when that movie, The Bridge, came out, the rates of suicide skyrocketed on the Golden Gate Bridge. I did not like that show at all. How dare you show somebody jumping off the bridge? It was horrible. I mean, if you've never seen something like it, it was horrible. It's it fascinates us. But still, to see that, I'm, I hate it because I worked up there and I looked in people's eyes. I get emotional. Yes, it's okay. And then see them jump. Yes, I. It's got to. It's got to be a nightmare. You got to see it in your head all the time. Yeah. And to have somebody report on that. Yeah. Oh, how dare you do something like that? And then they said, I spoke with the guy a little bit, the producer, and then he says, well, you know, it's to make uh, awareness about suicide and things. No, it wasn't. Quit lying. You're lying to yourself. To money. Yeah. yeah, it's about the money and then the fame and everything that goes with it. It's horrible. I would. It's so unconscionable to do something like that. Wow. Well, Kevin, uh, Kevin Briggs, uh, Pivotal dash, pivotal hyphen. There you go. Pivotal hyphen. Yes. <laughs> you got it. Pivotal hyphen points dot com. Yes, sir. That is how people find you. You are a one person who is a mental health expert, something we need more of. I want to thank you for taking time from your busy schedule because I know you have a lot of things to do. Um, and, you know, if I ever get a TED talk, I'm going to think of you. I mean, like, I got a TED Talk. I got a TED Talk. <laughs> I'm still at Fred. Maybe I might get a I hope you do. You'd be wonderful. <laughs> but they only do it once a year. It's like, the, what's that thing where you get the, uh, the Nobel Peace Prize? You know, right. I get my TED Talk. If You know, that'll be my big, my big selling point. I, I made the TED Talk. But I want to thank you again for taking your time to come out here and talk to me and talk to us. And um, you've been a wealth of information. And I noticed that even though we have a, bunch of, a lot of people on here, they're listening and they're not, which means by them not typing a bunch, that means they're actually listening, which means you grab their attention. And I appreciate that. And we will come back and talk again more. But I want to thank you from the bottom of my heart, because I think mental health is a big problem that we have in the world today. And, um, and, and if we don't deal with it, it's going to get worse. And it's it's to the point now where we've, we, it's gotten worse, but how do we make it get better or if we can make it better? So I just want to thank you again for coming on and I appreciate everything you've done and we'll talk again in the, in the future. Thank you, Stanley. Absolute pleasure. Thank you, sir. So thank you for joining us. Uh, if you want to, you know, we maintain what we do by subscriptions. And if you go on to uh, anchor.fm forward slash um, let me put it in here so you can see it. You can uh, you can actually help us by making a donation uh, so we can keep these uh, these type of podcasts going. From nine nine cents to nine ninety nine, we ask you to help. We're also you'll find us on Spotify, uh, Google Podcasts, and Apple Podcasts. And we thank you for joining us for this one, and we will see you again next week. Uh, good.